Amen and good evening. We are glad you're able to join us on this Wednesday night at our prayer and praise time here at Woodcrest. And let's start with our praise time. If you would, turn in your hymn book to song number 477. Song number 477, once you have that, please stand with me. Song number 477, He Keeps Me Singing. opportunity again that we have to uh, be here before you, Lord, as we look at the requests and uh, hopefully testimonies today, Lord, that we can uh, bring them to you both, Lord, in prayer and in praise, Lord, and just thank you for uh, the faithfulness of your people here tonight. I pray that you bless other uh, people. We pray that you bless Pastor and Connie as uh, they are away, Lord, and I just pray that you just give them a time of rest and relaxation. Just thank you for, again, all you've done for us in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Song number 489. Song number 489. All your anxiety. Song number 489. vacation down in uh, Branson. Uh, we won't give too much information out so you can't contact them. I'm pretty sure their phones have been off um, because they haven't talked to us either, which is okay. 
which is okay. Like as long as we don't care for them, that means they are doing well and laying low, so that's fine. I know they're looking forward to doing a lot of things. Uh, in your prayer bulletin that you have, we'll go through kind of our main ones on the left here, and if you have anything that uh, we up, can update, we'll allow you to do so. Um, you can see, again, Don Larson's uh, lumpectomy was rescheduled. Many of you who were on the prayer chain received that text about her surgeon getting sick. And so it is scheduled right now for the 16th, and we'll pray that that happens. Um, they say it might not, but they're hoping it will, and it'll be pushed again to the 23rd. So really praying that it happens on the 16th. So, so continue, those of you ha that have been praying, continue to pray for uh, Don and uh, family during this. Uh, you look a little further down um, the schedule here for Dolores Dowell's funeral. Many have been asking kind of what is going to happen on Monday. Um, you see there, there's a 9 to 10 a.m. breakfast, so they're doing it a little different. They're not going to do uh, mealtime afterwards. They'll do it at the beginning. And so everybody is invited, those that can come, 9 to 10 a.m. Uh, on that Monday, and then 10 to 10.30 is visitation, 10.30 is the funeral service, and then the 1 p.m. internment at Fort Snelling. So all are welcome. Continue to keep uh, Valerie and her family in prayer, as it says there. Uh, the next thing down is Patriot Sunday. Patriot Sunday is the next big kind of thing coming up that pastor is... Uh, looking, pushing, and looking forward to. We'll have our evangelist here that Sunday. Uh, evangelist Gleiser is there. Um, if you didn't get one of those cards yet, there are still many of these cards on the Welcome Center. You can pass out, uh, give to neighbors and friends uh, or coworkers, perhaps, um, and uh, invite people to come to that and also invite people to come to the evangelistic service that is uh, coming up. So things to pray for, but also that are kind of announcements at the same time. Um, so we want to keep these things that are happening in our in your prayer. You see the update on the missionary Diane Zimmer there. We were able to see her and her husband at uh, at Camp Chatech. Uh, when we were there for Teen Week, they stopped by, and uh, so it was neat to talk to them and see their heart. They're ready to go back, and um, they're looking forward to in September actually to go back. So as long as she the recovery and uh, all this stuff continues to go well, hopefully in September they'll be able to head back. So uh, a very uh, wonderful thing with uh, all the things she has been going through and uh, the family for sure during that time. So continue to pray for them. Any updates on those that are listed on here that uh, we need to update? All right, anybody to add? Anybody would like to add perhaps something to this list? Let us know you'd like us to pray for somebody, um, something happening. If not, that is fine. We'll move on. Yes, in the back. Kurt. Um, just an update on my dad. He's still in the hospital. It's been almost two weeks now. Um, he has encephalitis, which is a, a virus in the brain fluid. Um, so it's serious and uh, he still has a fever. Um, so they're kind of waiting for his, his temperature to go down and the virus just to run its course because they can't do much. So keep praying for him and thank you for your prayer so far. Uh, amen. Thank you for that, that update. We appreciate that. We'll continue to pray for Dad during this time. Anybody else updates on anything on there? Anybody like, again, to add anything that's not there? You see the military personnel there that uh, we pray for. Again, if you have updates on those or the people that uh, you have asked to be put on there, if they have moved or they're in a different location or uh, anything like that, please contact the, the church so we can update um, the bulletin and how it needs to be prayed for. And that way we can kind of uh, just continue to pray as they perhaps move around the world in, in many cases, these military people. And uh, so keep uh, our military in prayer. Any update on the physical needs list there that we can uh, either take off or if we need to add someone to the physical needs list, uh, we can do that. Uh, anybody like that? Let me see. All right, how about the spiritual needs? All right, we'll keep these in prayer. Unspoken requests. Anybody have an answered unspoken? Jim Knoyer, amen. Love it when there's an answered unspoken. Circle Jim Knoyer's there and praise uh, that God answered it. However, he uh, decided to answer that. And uh, so, all right, any other unspoken requests? Anybody that'd like to be added to it? Name added to the unspokens. Not, that's fine. And again, these are things that throughout a week, if you would like to be added, something comes up, you don't have to wait till Wednesday, call the church and say, hey, on the next Wednesday bulletin, please uh, you know, put my name down there or put this person's name in the physical or spiritual needs, and, and we'll get it on there and highlight it that way. Um, people can know that, hey, here's a new name, as you can see some of the highlighted 
names on the physical needs and spiritual needs, unspoken requests, those are uh, new to the uh, bulletin, so keep that uh, in mind. All right, before we get to testimony time, uh, just uh, some other announcements. Don't forget this, act this Saturday, Young Hearts have their activity. A lot of people sign up for that, so it looks like a lot of fun. Uh, Taylor's Falls activity. And then there's the baby shower for Becky Halsey here at the church from 3 to 6, drop-in shower. So hopefully you can make it and uh, enjoy that time uh, and celebrating this new life uh, that will be coming, uh, that God has given to the, the Halsey family there. All right, some testimonies. Some testimonies from you, something that uh, God has showed you, perhaps a verse, a, a thing at work, a co-worker, a great talk you had to, with a co-worker, something God was able to just show your family, a blessing. Uh, might not be something you told anybody, but you just like to uh, you know, thank God for it publicly. Uh, that's fine, too. You know? Anybody like that? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um. Last week, there were a lot of testimonies given about the Anoka County Fair, and that was such a blessing to me. Um, I'm unable to participate in that because of physical needs, but um, we do pray for it, and it was just such a blessing to hear what God has done through that booth, and I do hope that's something that they keep up. Yes, amen, amen, thank you. Anybody else? Oh, yes. Hi. I know a lot of you people know my dad, Floyd Lindell. I just wanted to tell you all thank you for praying. My husband's had bladder cancer. He's in the hospital. But they found out that his sister could help him pay his rent. And I will be able to go to a group home that's near Mercy Hospital. And my dad's going to take me to see it next week. But okay. it's been a difficult six months. Amen. Amen. Yes, thank you very much. Very faithful here on Wednesday nights. Uh, Father Floyd there. Is there another? I see a hand raised over here. I may missed it. All right, that's fine. Anybody else? Testimony. <laughs> I don't know if it's an actual raised hand, Gordy, if they're just throwing their hand up. Do you have something you want know, to say, Nathaniel? No? <laughs> we're, our eyes are always watching, so even if you just pretend, yeah, we're, we're there. We're there. We'll continue to think about the uh, teachers as I believe next week, is that start in service, Mr. Isaacs? Next week is in service, so that could be put in there as well already. Summer has, that is the end of summer officially. When the teachers start in service, summer's over. Uh, so um, that time, uh, um, preseason for soccer, preseason for volleyball, so this, the, the building will not be as quiet uh, for sure starting then until next, next spring. Um, so pray for the teachers as they get ready uh, for school to start. Uh, a lot of uh, enrollments, which is great. Mr. Ice, what, what are we at enrollment for the academy right now? 212. That's awesome. That's great. So uh, some big classes. Space is an issue, which is great. <laughs> All right. So uh, it's great. Continue to pray. As you can see on there, our college students, as they are uh, on their way, some very soon, this weekend even, and uh, some next week. And so there, many are leaving uh, for college, so keep them in prayer. Uh, we'll keep doing that. Any other testimonies before we go to prayer? Don't want to leave anybody out as we sat there and you thought about anything. All right. All right. Well, let us then go to prayer. You have your bulleted there. Uh, get with somebody uh, or, again, family, and give about 10 minutes. The piano will start to play, and we'll continue with our service this evening.
Again, we're so glad that you are here this evening. Wonderful Wednesday night, summer crowd. As you can see, our message, if it's up there, almost. All right, it'll brighten up. Persecuted but not forsaken. You have that in your notes. We, uh, in our teenage uh, gentlemen's group, we have been going through the life of David, lessons from the life of David, making the making of a man of God. And this was a, a particularly good lesson that I enjoyed uh, personally, uh, just something to uh, help me in uh, my walk, and hopefully it can be encouragement to you. So persecuted but not forsaken, first I want to read 2 Corinthians 4, 7, says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Verse 8 says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Verse 9 says, persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. This idea of being persecuted is that of being pursued by the enemy. Sometimes we think persecuted means bodily harm of some sort. But it just means being pursued. 
pursued by the enemy. And I like how commentator John Gill put it, pursued from place to place and followed with menaces, cor curses, and reproaches, laid hold on, prescribed, imprisoned, and threatened with the severest tortures and death itself. But our God never leaves us nor forsakes us. Though we are followed close by evil men and left by our friends, we are not forsaken of God. And there's not too many people in the Bible like King David who has gone through what this idea of being persecuted, pursued, embodies. You think of the life of David and you look back and we're going to do that today. I want to take David's life here and talk about this idea of being persecuted but not forsaken. And you might think, well, I'm not persecuted in my life. I've never been physically abused for my belief. I've never really even been yelled at for my belief. I've never been uh, somebody coming after me because of what I believe. Here's a question for you. Do people know what you believe? Your co-workers, your neighbors. I'm not saying just because people know that they're going to come after you, but the devil hates the Christian. And he's going to do what he can, and he's going to send people your way. Do people know what you believe? And so as we think through this persecuted but not forsaken, if you are living the Christian life as God wants you to live, there's going to be opposition. There's going to be people against you. You are going through, going to go through some hardship. I want us to first turn to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 19. 1 Samuel chapter 19. We're going to look at David's life here in 1 Samuel couple chapters after he has been, of course, already in King Saul's palace. And here in chapter 19 of 1 Samuel, look down at verse number 10. And it says, And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. I want to look at how do we make the right choice when dealing with hardships. How do we make the right choice when dealing with hardships? We see here that David's life once again was being threatened by Saul. You'll recall how many attempts Saul had already made upon the life of David. He made him captain in his army over a thousand men in order to have him killed in battle. He demanded from him a hundred dead Philistines as the price for marrying his daughter. Probably because he thought David would die doing that. How many did David come back after killing? Anybody know? Two hundred. Yeah. He's like, I'll double that. Twice Saul hurled a javelin at David to tip, pin him to the wall. And we finally read here that last time that he sent messengers to his house to kill him. And if you keep reading a couple verses there, you'll see that he didn't just send him once because David's wife said, oh, he's sick. So the messengers went back, told Saul. Saul sent him again saying, okay, if he's sick, I want you to pick up his bed and bring him to me so I can kill him. That's being pursued. <laughs> And you could see over and over, as David started to run at this point, how David was being pursued by Saul and by the enemy. And David had two choices dealing with this hardship. Try to deal it on his own, in his own way, or give it to God. So how did he choose to deal with these hardships? First of all, a couple things we need to understand is understanding who God is. First blank there, understand who God is. Turn to Psalm chapter 59 with me. Psalm chapter 59. We're going to look at David's response. Psalm chapter 59, many uh, theologians, commentators believe this is when he wrote this psalm, was in chapter 19 of 1 Samuel, while he was fleeing, while Saul was sending men to his house, and he wrote and communicated this psalm here, chapter 59, during that time, and it's very likely, and we'll see that in the wording here. But we need to understand who God is, and let's see what David says here. In verse 1, he says, Deliver me from mine enemies, O my God. Defend me from them that rise up against me. First of all, who is God? He is a personal God. Again, this isn't going to be something that is brand new to probably any of you, but hopefully encouraging reminders in this day. He's a personal God. 
The Apostle Paul understood this point and, and he lived this life uh, accordingly. In Romans 1 8, he says, First, I thank my God. 1 Corinthians 1 4, I thank my God. 1 Corinthians 14 18, I thank my God. Philippians 1 3, I thank my God. Chapter 4, verse 19, but my God. Philemon 1 4, I thank my God. Who was God to Paul? He was my God. He was his God. And I thought about this. I said, when was the last time, if I talked to anybody about God and who God was, when was the last time I referred to him as my God when talking about him? A lot of times we talk to maybe an unbeliever and we, we say, well, God created the world. God sent his son. God uh, then forgives sins. When we could very easily say as a believer, my God created the world. My God saves me from my sins. My God sent his son. My God does this for me. And we need to personalize God. But we don't so many times in our Christian life. So many times in our Christian life, God is still this overseeing power. And yes, we understand his sovereignty as overseer, but that's as close as he gets to us. And we don't personalize God. David understood who God was in this moment because he could look back and see what God already had done for him. And he could say, my God is this. And my God is a personal God. We need to understand this God of the universe is your God. And this is key when dealing with personal issues, that you're not going alone on it. You have a God that cares about you. So he understood that he was a personal God. Secondly, he understood that he was a powerful God. Look at verse 5. Thou therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen. Be not merciful to any wicked transgressors. Selah, verse, down to verse 16. He says, but I will sing of thy power. David knew the power. And again, we see in the New Testament. I'm going to read a bunch of verses off here. So, so listen and see what, what uh, again, Paul and Peter are writing. 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved is the power of God. Verse 24 of that same chapter, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and wisdom and the wisdom of God. Chapter 2, verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. 2 Corinthians 6, 7, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. 2 Corinthians 13, 4, for though he was crucified through weakness... Yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. 2 Timothy 1.8 Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partakers of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of God. 1 Peter 1.5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You understand the power that created this universe, that sent the flood, that parted the sea, that sent fire from heaven, that calmed the sea, that raised the dead, that saves your soul, that keeps you unto eternal life, is the same power that wants to bring you through your trial. Bring you from those that pursue you. He wants to separate you from the evil that is of this world, and yet we are drawn to that evil. We are pulled by that old man that wants to come forth, that old man that wants to drive us. But that old man is dead because of what Christ has done on the cross, and yet we, don't, we, we choose to go back to it. God has given us that power. His power sustains his children through the most harsh circumstances. David understood what God could do through him, and for him, and without him. This power is only God-given, and that is why even believers so many times fail and fall. We don't trust in or give our lives over to the power of God. David understood the situation he was in and knew God had saved him from death before, and he will do it again. Again, you look back at David's life. Defeating the bear and the lion, defeating Goliath, defeating Saul's plans against him, all these times that the power of God showed in David's life. And David understood that. He's like, all right, you've done it before. I'm going to sing of your power. I understand your power. You've shown it. I'm going to live by it. Thirdly, we see 
that he's a protective God. A protective God. In verse 9 of that of Psalm 59, because of his strength will I wait upon thee, for God is my defense. Verse 17, unto thee, O my strength, will I sing, for God is my defense, and the God of my mercy. David knew the strength of the enemy there in verse 9. He says, because of his strength will I wait upon thee. He was, he's not talking about because of God's strength will he wait on him. He's saying because of the enemy's strength, because of Saul sending his men, however many men at that time Saul sent, because of Saul sending his men to come after me, he's one guy going against the king's army. He's like, I, I've got no other choice but to wait on God. I've got no other choice but to wait and see what God's going to do. Because God's going to protect me. The psalmist used many words to describe how God is protective. They use the word defense nine times, the word shield 16 times, a high and strong tower four times, buckler, which is just another certain type of shield four times. So many different ways the psalmist used this idea of being defended by God. David most likely didn't fully understand maybe how many times his life was spared. We have many of them recorded for us, but that probably isn't the whole picture. God protects us without us even knowing or asking because he is our Heavenly Father. I, that, that's something that I don't know if you've heard that expressed where I want to get to heaven so I can see how many times God actually spared my life. I don't know. I've done some dumb things. I like to say it's while I was savvy enough to get, but no, no, God had to spare me through something because there were some dumb things I did. And he spares our life for a reason. God spared David's life. He was protecting David for a reason. David had a purpose. God has put you here. To, he has protected you today up until this point because he still has a purpose for you. Your purpose in this life is not over. Your purpose in this life is, has not ended so we need to continue to live for God because he's got me here for a reason. He's going to protect me. He already has. And many of you can see different ways that he has protected your family, how he has looked after you, how he has provided for you, maybe have been, has been that defense for you in different ways. And you can see that, and we need to remember that. So we understand who God is. David understands who God is. And then we understand Understanding the enemy. We need to understand the enemy. Look back at verse 3 of Psalm 59. We'll read verse 3 through 7 and then we'll, we'll uh, jump back and talk about it. Verse 3 says, For lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me, not for my transgression nor for my sin, O Lord. They run and prepare themselves without my fault. Awake to help me and behold... Thou therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen. Be not merciful to any wicked transgressors, Selah. They return at evening. They make a noise like a dog and go round about the city. Behold, they belch out with their mouth. Swords are in their lips. For who say they doth hear? Some interesting people that are chasing him. Some good description that David sees these men. Let's talk about understanding the enemy and what David talks about the enemy. First of all, they wait. Let's get that on there. They wait for you to fail. They wait for you to fail. Look at verse 3. For lo, they lie and wait for my soul. Satan has deceived the world into believing that Christians think of themselves better than anyone else around them, which is interesting we get blamed for a lot of things when they must not really understand what a true Christian is. They believe we are the intolerant ones and, the one, and that we are the reasons things such as racism exist in this world. They would like nothing more than to see a believer make a wrong choice so they can be vindicated of their unbelief. They wait for you to fail so they can point it out and claim hypocrite. I remember working at General Mills and Worked there for five years, and we had uh, worked with a lot of, I uh, worked with some good guys, and, and then some that, of course, didn't care about Christianity, and, uh, or respected it. And there was this one gentleman who seemed to wait for me to say the wrong thing, and in this particular instance, I don't think I said the wrong thing. I may have, uh, you know, you get to work with the guys, and there's a lot of give and take, right? You know, we make, they make fun of me, I make fun of them, and it, you know, goes back and forth. It's all harmless, 
okay? And, uh, and so I, maybe that was the situation. And he calls me out and says, that wasn't very Christian-like. And I said, what do you know about being a Christian? He's like, well, I know it's not that. Okay, show me what it is. <laughs> and uh, we had an interesting five-second discussion about it um, because that's all he knew about it was a Christian doesn't talk down to anybody. Well, clearly by the tone of my voice, that was, <laughs> they have been talking down to somebody. I don't know what happened. Either way, he was looking for ways and waiting for me to fail in some way in his mind that I was failing. Worked at another job called CIFCO, and uh, machine job, machine shop job, and uh, they would uh, try to get me to curse. You say, how do they do that? Well, they, they, try, they didn't try to make me angry. They tried to say words, hey, do you know this? Do you know this? Do you know this? And of course, I am an ignorant preacher boy kid. Didn't know a lot of them, uh, but knew enough of them, so I knew not to say certain things, but they would try to get me to curse. And I remember them saying, I don't know why I'm tell, if I have to tell this whole story, but I, I remember them saying a certain word, I didn't, like, and I didn't know what they said, so I repeated it, because I really didn't know what they said. And uh, they were all up in arms, and they went running around the building saying, hey, we just got Portman to curse, he said this, and that. I'm like, what just happened? No clue. But they lie, they're waiting for me to fail. Why? Because then that ruins my testimony. That ruins anything that I'm trying to establish. And if they could get me to say something without, you know, if they, even if they trick me into it, it's a point for them. That is the world. They wait for you to fail because it makes them feel better about themselves. They wait for you to fail. We know, again, the Bible says that the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The lion awaits for the weak to be separated from the herd, then attacks. The enemy is waiting for you to fail to be, and be unprepared so they can attack you at your weakest. David, in this moment, is feeling very weak. He's feeling alone. His wife is by his side. His wife is actually lying to her father for him. I mean, it's dangerous in itself. Emotionally, physically, and perhaps even spiritually, David was at this moment understanding and realizing who the enemy is. First of all, we see they wait for you to fail. Secondly, they prepare without reason. They attack without reason. Change my notes. They attack without reason. Verse 4, they run and prepare themselves without my fault. Awake to help me and behold... David had done nothing wrong to deserve this kind of treatment from these men, but they were determined to obey the king. The king said, go attack this man. They don't know why, but they're going to do it. I don't know if you, you probably remember, when we had a lot of the issues happening in downtown, kind of the mob stuff going on, and a lot of people that you see on interviews didn't know why they were doing what they were doing. They were a part of it. There was a crowd. I'm running with it. And that was, they didn't understand why. Because someone said to do it. Okay. And so they went. And they figured out eventually that, okay, I'm going to be on the side of this. Why? Because everybody wants to be on the side of the crowd, of the majority. They don't want to be, you know, someone that's going against the majority. And so they prepared themselves without reason the men that were attacking David were attacking without reason. There was nothing David had done wrong. And so David is confused here. We get confused as believers. Why are we being attacked by, on social media, by, by political parties? Why are we being attacked by people in our neighborhood sometimes just going after us for being a believer, for being a Christian? Why? We've done nothing wrong. Again, that's the world. That is Satan's plan. He wants to discourage you. He wants to get you double thinking, man, I'm tired of standing up for what's right. I'm tired of doing what's right. I'm tired of following the Bible. I'm tired of making all the right choices the best I can. I'm tired of it. I'm just going to go and, and, and walk the line a little closer to the world side of it because it won't be so hard. They're preparing for you to do that because they're ready. They're ready for you. Thirdly, we see they don't stop 
searching. In verse 6, they return at evening. They make noise like a dog and go round about the city. The enemy doesn't leave you alone just because you have evaded them a few times, just because you have victory a couple times in your life. Maybe there's that, that besetting sin, as the Bible talks about. Maybe you have a little temptation in your life, things that you're dealing with, and you've gotten victory a couple times over. Guess what? Satan does not stop. He does not stop. No matter how many years you've gotten the victory over whatever it may be in your life, he does not stop bringing the enemy to you. He doesn't stop bringing those people. They constantly search for ways to destroy your testimony and even you. It mentions here uh, in verse 6 that they make noise like a dog. When a hunting dog is on its prey, they make a lot of noise, uh, more for two reasons, a couple of others, but for two uh, main reasons. One, to signal for others that it has found what they were hunting for. And two, to scare the prey into revealing where it's hiding. A lot of noise scares people. A lot of dog barking will scare people. My children are this way. Sorry kids, it's okay. If a dog is barking or it runs and then also it starts barking, it, it's frightening. I'll jump. All right, I will. I'm bigger than most dogs. Okay, at least in my neighborhood. And uh, it, it can be scary. A dog comes running at the fence and it's just then barking like crazy. That dog could easily hop that fence. Hopefully it doesn't know that. But it could easily jump that fence. And it is scary. We have uh, one of our neighbors, there is a six foot fence, but there's a, a, a hole in the fence. Uh, the top, probably two feet, there's like a notch that got broken off. And this dog, I don't know what kind of breed it is, we'll just say big. All right, and it's got one of those low, rough barks, but super loud. If you're walking by that fence, because it's a privacy fence, you don't see it coming. All of a sudden, just woof, right up on that thing, and you're right there, and it's barking. Oh, man. Your heart skips that beat every time. Every time. It is so loud, and it's just right there, and its head is bigger than mine. I mean, it's a, a big head, okay? Gives you... You're laughing because you guys can picture it. It's like, wait a second, Pastor Mark. <laughs> that might not be possible. Okay. It's a big dog, all right? It's a big dog. Anyways, it's scary. And so here's the, David's picture of the enemy like dogs. They're coming back constantly, constantly. They're making a lot of noise. They're trying to get me to jump. They're trying to get me to give myself up and say, okay, here I am. Stop barking. Stop yelling at me. Stop persecuting me. Stop pursuing me. I'm here. Okay, I give in. I give up. I'm, I'm just going to, you know, toss in the towel. They want you to reveal yourself, your true character. It mentions also they go round about the city. They cover all the area until they succeed in their mission. The enemy of God is unrelenting. Satan does not rest in his quest to devour the unsuspecting prey. We should not rest in our quest to seek God's help each and every day. This is what we need to do, and David is understanding this. We also see them, they hurt without guilt. Verse 7, behold, they belch out with their mouths, swords are in their lips, for who, say they, doth hear? They will use their speech to hurt and tear down those that oppose them without fear of what people will say. And why is that? Well, in this, this case, it's because they have the king on their side. And no one will go against the king. When you have people in authority that are allowing you to say something and letting you get away with saying something, then why would you stop saying it? No matter who it hurts. And this is what they were doing. David's saying they are yelling things. They're probably, one commentator thought they're probably threatening his wife. They thought that they were probably saying things to his wife and, and, and threatening her, trying to get him to reveal himself, reveal where he's hiding, reveal where he was. And so they're probably saying things against, uh, again, his wife, his family there. And so, and they could do that. Because even though David, yes, lived in the palace, and yes, he was captain in the palace, the king said, hey, you got to get this guy, and so the enemy's going to do whatever it takes to get their man. And they're going to say whatever they need to say. The world will have no problem going after families. In fact, they want to destroy families. They want to hurt families. They want to pull apart the family. Because if they could pull apart the family, then, then that family is weak. The family is weak. 
the husband stays strong on the scripture, the wife starts to fade and so kids will follow. The wife stays strong on the scripture, the husband starts to fade, kids will follow. It, it's, it, the devil wants to separate the family. He wants to split it up and they will hurt and Satan does not care. The devil lies. Teenagers, young people in here, the devil lies. All right, things that are put on TV, things that are put in social media, the influencers, the devil is lying. And who are you going to trust? Who are you going to follow? They hurt without guilt. So here's the enemy. Here's the enemy. All right? They are not for day. We need to understand the enemy. So then thirdly, what then? All right, understanding what our response is. We need to understand what our response is. If we understand who God is, and then we see and we understand the enemy and what they're trying to do, how do we then take that into practice that, understanding what our response is? First of all, first of all, we need to call for deliverance. Look at verse 1 and 2 again. Verse 1, David is calling, deliver me from mine enemies, O my God. Defend me from them that rise up against me. Verse 2, deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloody men. Twice, David's calling. He's in a position that he cannot help. He says, deliver me. Many times David was in that position. The only thing he could do was call out to God to deliver him. And you think about, as you look back at David's life, Saul had him pinned many times. He had him in a cave a couple times. There was another time when, when he was just across the valley, and Saul could have easily gotten to him and taken his life. But Saul was pulled away because the Philistines were attacking another part of his uh, uh, the, the Judah there, all right, and, and Jerusalem area. And so Saul was pulled away. And David's life was spared again. Many times David had to call for deliverance. Psalm 18.48 says, He delivereth me from mine enemies. Yea, thou liftest me up above those that rise up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. The only one that can deliver you from grip of Satan is our God. And we cannot have deliverance without Christ's sacrifice on the cross, which defeated death and hell. Calling for deliverance humbles your life and causes you to realize your total dependence on God. But you know, we're not going to call for deliverance if we don't think we need help. If we don't think, well, the enemy isn't that strong. Well, you know what? There is this one little area, there is this one little thing, but really nobody knows about it, and it's just, it's, it's a little thing, and I could deal with it. That's the lie of Satan. Satan. He doesn't want you to get help from God. He doesn't want you to be delivered from sin. He doesn't want you to be delivered from heartache and the pursuit of evil men, the pursuit of those that would like to see your life destroyed, your family destroyed. We need to daily be calling for deliverance. Lord, deliver me today. The next morning, Lord, deliver me today. Deliver me and he does, and when he delivers you, you thank him for that deliverance. You thank him for getting you through the day, being delivered because of what he has done for you. Secondly, we need to call for strength. We see this in verse 17 again. Unto thee, O my strength, will I sing, for God is my defense and the God of my mercy. Strength to be patient. We see that again. We read verse 9 because of the enemy's strength. Will I wait upon thee? How much strength does it take to wait on God? When things are tough, maybe financially, maybe things at work, maybe there's family struggles, maybe there's something going on in your personal life, and, and it's, we want it fixed right now. But God says, just wait. Just wait. Keep doing the right thing. Keep making the right choice, and just wait. That takes strength. It takes strength to wait. We are so often want to take matters into our own hands when we have been hurt or wronged. We want to blame somebody for hardships that we are going through. We need strength to be patient and wait for God to reveal his plan. Because God has a plan. God has a plan. And unfortunately, what happens is we want to take the plan into our own hands, and so we make our own plan, try to follow that. It falls apart. And they're like, okay, Lord, I, what did I do wrong? 
and we need to get back on God's plan. God can give you that strength because he has that power to do so. Lastly, we need to call for courage. In verse 14, I, I like how David ends this, uh, this psalm or these next couple verses here. Verse 14, it says, and at, evening and, or excuse me, and at evening, let them return, and let them make a noise like a dog and go around about the city. Let them wander up and down for me and grudge if they be not satisfied. But I will sing of thy power, yea, I will sing a lot of thy mercy in the morning. For thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. Unto thee, O my strength, will I sing. For God is my defense and the God of my mercy. David at his lowest point, at the point of he's, he's understanding who God is, he knows who God is, he knows his power, he knows his protection, he's been through it all, God has helped him before, he understands who the enemy is, he's letting God know all these things, and then he says, okay, now bring it on. <laughs> That's how I read it anyways. He says, bring it on. He says, he starts to be filled with courage and states, let them return. Let them make noise. Let them go around about the city. Let them wander looking for me. Bring it on. Let's go. I know my God. I know what he can do. I'm going to wait on him. Come on, God's got a plan for me. I'm going to do what's right. Bring it on. We gain courage by reminding ourselves who God is and what he has already done for us. When we forget those things, it becomes very easy to be discouraged and downtrodden. We then build up in our minds that no one cares and that we are all alone. When was the last time you were able to maybe tell someone about Christ, even though you were afraid to do it, but you said, all right, bring it on, Satan. I, I, I've got to do the right thing here. When you make that hard choice, say, bring it on. I've got to make the right choice. Let it come. Let the enemy come. I'm going to do what's right because God is my deliverer. God is my strength. And I've got courage to do what is right, even though I don't want to. I've got the courage to do it because God is giving me that courage. And I like, again, how he ends in verse 16 and 17. It's not in your notes, but he says, I sing. I sing. He says, you can come after me, but I'm going to keep singing. This is how David proclaimed God. He proclaimed God through song. He will sing of God's power, sing of God's mercy, sing of God's strength. He is reminding himself of who God is as his defense and refuge. Do you have a song in your heart when times are tough? Do you have a song that reminds you of who God is when there are things that are in your life that are not going correctly? You know, it's hard to, uh, and I feel bad, not feel bad, I understand more um, song leaders and what they see in return. I'm like, man, not a lot of singing going on. You know, there's nowhere in scripture that said David was a good singer. It said he could play a mean harp said that. It doesn't say he was a good singer. And what does it say David did constantly? What he would do? He would sing. He would sing. And yet we get so self-centered during the singing time. Do I have to stand over here? Is that camera going to follow me? We get so self-centered during the singing time like someone's going to hear me or what it looks like is I don't believe what I'm saying. Now, I hope that's not true. I've sung this song a hundred times. Doesn't mean anything to me anymore. Can I tell you it's a heart issue at that point? It's a heart issue at that point. When you are no longer full of singing because of who God is and the song doesn't fill your heart, do you understand that for all eternity you will be singing? Have you read that part in the Bible yet? You will be singing. Start warming up your voices now. You'll be singing. Have joy. And, even, and the, the great thing about song is even though David was not in a place of joyfulness, was he? He was not in a place in his life that, that was fun for him. He was not there to rejoice over, over what position he was in his life. But he was going to keep singing about who God was. And that filled his heart with that joy, with that peace, with that courage. Because through song, he could express himself the way God and who God was to him. 
Why don't we do that today? What has changed? Do you fill your life with songs that would honor God, that point your life and your heart to God? Or is it just the latest one that came out on the top 100 list? That's the one that everybody else is singing, so that's the one I'm going to sing. Do you sing songs? You might not sing here. Do you sing songs at home? To yourself? Do you have a song in your heart that shows God? David said, I'm going to sing on no matter what has been going on around me. And I hope that you all have that heart, that you can look and say, okay, I understand God's strength. I understand God's mercy. I understand who God is. I understand who the enemy is as well, but I'm going to keep rejoicing. I'm going to keep having joy. I'm going to keep this peace that God gives me, and I'm going to sing about it, and I'm going to tell others about it, and I'm going to live my life in a way that I know I may be pursued, but I'm not forsaken because God is on my side and he's my defense. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this time you've given us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the life of David. And oh, Lord, we know he wasn't perfect. He know he, we know he didn't make all the right choices. And yet, Lord, he was, as it is said, that he was a man after your own heart, Lord because he desired to do what was right. And when he made those wrong choices, Lord, he asked forgiveness, he repented, Lord, and tried to come back to you. Lord, we think of this idea of being persecuted or pursued, and we may not fully understand it like David did. But Lord, I pray that when hardships come in our life and and Satan is right there trying to get us to turn from you, that you would allow us the courage, the strength, Lord, the ability to uh, look to you through those hard times. Lord, I pray this message was an encouragement. Lord, I pray that we can continue to sing on, that we can continue through this life. Lord, understand that uh, what we have in our heart is what you see. Lord, I pray if there's someone here today who, again, is going through some things, things that they think no one knows about, Lord, the enemy is surrounding them. The enemy is waiting for them to slip up. The enemy is waiting. Lord, I pray that you would protect and that you would guide them back to you. Thank you again for this time you have given us. If you would stand with me, please, just briefly this evening. As the piano plays, if you need to, as you stand there, just, just thank God for who he is. Just thank God for who he is. Thank him for being a powerful God a protective God. Thank him for being a personal God to you. Be encouraged by it. Lord, thank you again so much. Please bless these Uh, all these activities that are happening this weekend, Lord, and I pray that you give good weather and that uh, everyone would have a great time of fellowship, Lord, together. We think of, again, these requests and they're made known. Lord, we pray that you would just continue to have your hand in their lives. Thank you again for the people that are here. Bless them, Lord, for their faithfulness and give them a great week of uh, whatever they have in their life that you have planned for them. And uh, bless, uh, again, just uh, uh, all that you have done for us. Thank you so much in your name. Amen. All right. Thank you so much for coming again. Those things are happening this weekend. Young and Heart Activity, the baby shower. Don't forget those things. And have a great weekend. We will see you on Sunday for Evangelist Joe Sturtz. You are dismissed. Mm-hmm.